jean pants with the holes in it and, and the hair spiked up. And, you know, it, that's just his thing. He's a youth pastor. That's what you got to do. But when this guy opened his mouth to speak, it was all like, what's up, y'all? Yo, yo, uh, don't be fronting for real, though. See, what had happened was, Jesus, you know. And it was like, what? These kids were looking at him like, man, you're a moron, you know. He was just putting on this deal like he was, you know. And I got this picture of my mind of this guy going into the bank to try to get a job like that, you know. Like, uh, whoa, what's up, Mr. Bank President? I am here to be getting a job, you know. He was doing, no, you wouldn't go to the bank president like that. You would go to him in the honor and the respect that his office deserves. I mean, have you, you ever go to a job interview and, you know, you're on your best, you on your yes sirs and no ma'ams and you're polite, respectful, you're uh, uh, attentive, you got your good clothes on, you, you, I mean, you there, you know what I mean? You, you there, you focused, you like, you, a little nervous maybe, a little afraid, a little in fear, you know, I got to do good, I got to do right, I don't want this guy to think I'm an idiot, I want to get the job. Um, if, you know, if you think of the person that you find the most important person on the planet, you know, like whether you like the president or not, if he was to come and, and give you five minutes to talk to him about what you think the country should be doing, would you go in just like, Woo, I'm sure I'm tired, man. Them biscuits was good this morning. Woo, you know, no. You would have your deal down. You would be ready. You would be, you'd be, you'd be giving him the, the honor that his office deserved. You know, if you, if you talk to the head of a company, a CEO, you would, you would come to them in the respect that they deserve. But we come to God on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, whenever. Come to him in prayer on Tuesday. Come to him at our job. Like we're just some teenager bebopping down the hallway with a hat on, on sideways and pants hanging down to your thigh. Y'all seen them guys? Just come to them any way we want to, you know? More, more often than not, we see this all the time, is that we come to God not for God, but for what God can do for me. We come to God, we come to church because... I don't want God, I don't want to be in a relationship with Him. I don't want Him ruling in my life. I don't want Him to be the Lord and tell me what I'm going to be doing and what I'm not going to be doing. I don't want Him to tell me how I'm going to dress. I don't want Him to tell me how I'm going to speak. I don't want Him to tell me how, what I'm going to watch or what I'm going to do or how I'm going to treat people. But I want to go to heaven. And I want to, I want to have enjoyment in this life. And I don't want to be sick. And I, and I want to get a job. Men come in that lost their wife and they'll come and they'll... God, please, God, please. They don't want God. They just want the wife back. The reason I know that, I can't see their heart, but the reason I know that is because when the wife either comes back or don't come back, and it's clear that one of the two is going to happen, God gets left in the dust. They go back to whatever it was I was doing before. I talked this morning about a guy had a stroke maybe a few years ago, and I never seen, we visited him in the hospital, and i never seen somebody cry out to God like this guy did. He, the doctors told him, you'll never walk again. You'll never have the use of this whole side again, ever. And i never seen somebody cry out to God like he did. We prayed with him. Brother Eddie prayed with him, visited him every day. You know, months and months and months he was in the hospital. What happened? God healed him. He's working today. But what happened? Left God in the dust. Gone, back to life, back to everything else. Everything just went right back to normal. You know, his family, when he was in the hospital, was under some serious financial strain, serious trouble. He was the breadwinner. Wife was crying out, God, please, please. Went back to work. I mean, I, don't, I can't see their hearts, but I know what happened afterward. Went back to work. God gets left in the dust. He's gone. He's gone. So let's read this first verse here. This coming to God thing, we come to God, it's serious. It's not, it's not, it's not a playtime, it's not a joke, it's not something to be trifled with. What happens with us in our lives, whatever it is, whether it's God, whether it's your wife, your husband, the more time you spend with it, the more you take it for granted. The more you get familiar with it, you know. The more, the more you don't, we don't realize just how important that thing is until it gets ripped out from under you. And, and we do the same thing with God. We come to Him like he's my homeboy, you know, my, you know, and he's, he's God. He's the sovereign Lord of the universe. Let's read this first verse. It says, keep your foot, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God. It means like watch your step to me. It means like watch how you walk in. Keep guard how you, how you walk in. Guard your step when you go to the house of God. 
and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. People come not one God, but the benefit of God. I talk, we talked about 9-11, you know, when the, building, when the planes hit those buildings. I mean, did you see church the next week? Oh, it was slam-packed full. No, you couldn't sit nowhere. It was full. People were scared. They had their security took from them. They had their comfort took from them. They didn't know what was going to happen next. They cried out to God. But then two weeks later, church is back empty again. When they realized, hey, my house ain't going to blow up tomorrow, everything went back to normal. It's okay. We didn't want God. We wanted what God can give us. Now look at that last part. It says, keep your foot when you go to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. What do you think of when you think of the word evil? You think of monsters and, and murderers and demons and, and rapists and you know, evil people and evil blackness and monster movies. And, uh, you, know, you think of all this horror and terror and all this stuff, but that's not what the verse is saying. It's saying the people that come into the house of God, look, that are not more ready to hear, I'm just quoting the verse right here, more ready to hear, but come and give the sacrifice of fools, they don't consider that they are doing evil. You may tell you what evil is, besides all the murder and bank robber and demons and all the things that come to our mind when you hear the word evil. Evil would be a man who come to church this morning, rolled out of bed, threw his shirt on, strolled in 10 minutes late, sat down, don't really want to be here, don't really care what's going on, here for some other reason, somebody invited him, somebody, you know, maybe I'm here just because I need to get something or whatever, could care less about the music, could care less about coming and worship before God, could care less about the sermon, texting, Emailing the good people putting up their phones. I said, <laughs> I wasn't talking about y'all. No, I'm just kidding. Texting, checking your email, thinking about what you got to do, thinking about going to the Dairy Queen after service. I'm, my stomach's growling. That person, when the preacher says amen, he gets out of his seat and he walks out the door thinking in his mind, I've done God a favor today. I did good today by coming and sitting in the house of the Lord. I've done a good thing. God is sure proud of me. But God says, when you come to his house and you're not more ready to hear and you give the sacrifice of fools, you're doing evil. That man walks out of here and in God's sight, he's done evil in the eyes of the Lord. Okay? He's done evil. Maybe a second example is a guy who comes... Just to, just to rub elbows with all the high society people rolling around in the church, you know? You got all the, all the folks I want to network with. I want to increase my business model. I want to I wanna get to know all these other folks. I need to make sure, you know, I got to gotta network, got to get, you know, got to get my name out there. got to gotta pass out my business cards, whatever that may be. He comes, don't really care to come to God, to worship God, to come and to hear the words of God and have them change his heart so that he would be more conformed to Jesus Christ when he leaves. He come to offer the sacrifice of fools and he doesn't realize, doesn't consider that he's doing evil. Maybe another one is, is the person that comes so they can lose themselves in the music, you know? Not necessarily worshiping, but just the music. You know, it's all about the music. The music is, you know, I, I can relate to this kind, you know. Not worshiping God, not thinking on Jesus Christ who paid for my sin, not thanking God for the life that he gave me, not thanking God for who he is and what he's done, not thanking him for my family, not thank. But just, man, it sure feels good. Sure feels good to lose myself in the music, you know. That, that uh, when you, having, having a background in music, um, it, it scares me. Music scares me. It's powerful. And it, it, it uh, you know, when you stand, especially when you stand in front of people and you play music or when you're listening to music, you know, especially in a big crowd, um, 
It's real powerful. And when I was saved, when I, when I was saved, or even before I was saved, I was playing music in church. You know, I had done left the music scene. But I saw the same reaction that I seen from thousands of people, like in Skullbone Amphitheater, listening to music that had nothing to do with God. The same reaction I saw from them, I could see from people in gospel singings and Christian concerts and out there at the FedEx Forum when, the, when the, the Christian band, you know, I could see the same thing. Now, these people were saying, oh, God moved, you know, but I didn't see the same thing when it was 3,000 drunks, you know. So that, I'm not saying you can't worship, and you can't, but I'm saying that scares me. It scares me. M- music scares me. So I'm real careful. I remember uh, on East Main, I played the guitar in the, in the praise band when guitar players started flooding in. Uh, I moved to the soundboard, um, and I was I was I was really happy doing that. I really was, and I remember going to Brother Eddie after services and talking to him about having problems with pride, you know, because that's always been my thing. I, I hate music, really, but I've been good at it all my life. So it was all about I'm the man, I'm the man. It wasn't about man. I love music; it's so beautiful. It was about ain't I the man? I've always been the man. But what I didn't realize, I would play in church before I, before I came to Christ Church. I'd play in church. People would cry. Oh, God moved. <laughs> God moved when you played, you know. No. I didn't come for God. I didn't come ready to hear. I offered the sacrifice of fools. And I wasn't considering that I was doing evil in God's sight. So I can say to you today that as I said, I picture myself on a stool. I used to sit on a stool, play the acoustic guitar at the other church. and Evil. Doing evil. I was doing evil when I was doing that. So as I'm looking at this and I'm saying we're going to, you know, verse 2 talks about prayer. And you can read the whole, read the whole chapter when you get home. Verse 2 talks about prayer. Verse 3 talks about, I mean, verse 4 and 5 and 6 talk about making commitments before God. And it seemed like, how can you come? Okay? If, how can I come, how can I come in an attitude, in a heart, in a mindset that's not evil before God? What kind of mind do I come through the door and I sit in church and listen to the word of God preached? What kind of mind do I do it in? It's a mind that stayed on Jesus Christ and what he did for us, and I'm going to tell you why. It's a mind that trusts only in him for our salvation and only in him before our worth before God. When I was a child in, in the 80s, there was this terrorist uh, captured a bunch of people, you know, and, and, and Ronald Reagan was the one that brought them home, and y'all, I mean, it was all over the news. It was, I was too young to remember any of the stuff, but you see the footage, and these people are leaving this, these terrorist captive, captivity things, and they're, they're back on American soil. They come, and they're getting off the plane, and when they hit the, the runway, they drop down to their knees, and they kiss the ground. All this group of people kissing the ground, putting their old clean lips on the nasty ground. Because they had been captured, you know, they'd been tortured. There was other people on the plane, government workers, diplomats, pilots, all this. Uh, they didn't kiss no ground when they got off the plane. They just strolled off the plane. It was like waving at the cameras, smiling. You know, we didn't brought them home. Here they are. So what makes one group fall down on their face and kiss the ground and the other group say, hey, how y'all? It's because... They knew where they had come from, and they knew where that they had been brought to. And that's the mindset of the worshiper of God that knows, that that focuses that on Jesus Christ, focuses on who we are. Now, I reminded you, I told you last time, I'm going to remind you this time. The last time I was here and preached from Ecclesiastes, I reminded you that because we're sinners... Wretched, nasty, horrible, disgusting. There's not enough adjectives for me to describe how awful of a sinners we are to God. And so because of that, I, re- I told you, remember, that 
we deserve condemnation and wrath from God every second of every day. As the seconds click by, I deserve wrath. I deserve destruction. I deserve every second. So what that means is that every second that ticks by on that clock, that I am not given wrath. Every second that I'm allowed to enjoy something beautiful, anything, a sunset, uh, any second that I'm allowed to enjoy my family, any moment of the day I'm allowed to enjoy fishing or hunting or riding four-wheelers or anything that you find enjoyable in life, any piece of comfort and enjoyment that you have has been bought and paid for by the death of Christ on the cross because you and I don't deserve anything but condemnation in each one of those seconds that ticks by. But today, what I want you to see is that Christ is so much more precious than that. He is so much greater than even that. Even that He paid for our sin, even that He bought us eternal life, even that He bought us the mercy of having enjoyments. Just simple, simple, you know, I like to ride motorcycles. The fact that I'm able to enjoy a motorcycle instead of enduring God's wrath at that moment is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for me. And that's the only reason. But here's the thing I want to show you. What we find from this passage here is that, in verse 1, right there, our worship itself is tainted by sin. And it's unacceptable to God. It's unacceptable. When we offer worship, when we sit in here and our minds wander, when we, when we, it's unacceptable. What I'm saying is, if you and I walk in that door, and for one second of the time that we're here in the house of God, that mind wanders, it's unacceptable. Verse 2, you can read it when you get home. It talks about, go ahead, I'll read it. Put it up there, Houston. It says, Be not rash with your mouth, and let not your heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God's in heaven, and thou upon earth, therefore let thy words be few. Our prayers that we pray to God. Psalm 66, 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. It doesn't say He can't hear me. It says He will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Our prayers are unacceptable to God. Going on, uh, you can read it when you get home. Verse 4 through 6 talks about vows and commitments. When, when the Jews would come and worship, it was part of their worship to make vows and commitments to God. But our commitment to Him, our vows, they're unacceptable. I thought about today as I was coming here this morning, I thought about all the vows that I've made before God. God, if you do this for me, I promise I'll... I, I've done a bunch of them. I've done a bunch of them. And I, I could not think of a single one that I have kept perfectly. Now, I've kept some... You know, I've kept it this moment and failed in it this moment. And kept it this moment, failed in it this, But I can't think of a single one that I've kept. I promised him. I pro, if you do this for me, I'll do this for you. And promised him, I can't think of a single one that I kept perfectly. Our vows, and he knew that I wasn't going to keep it. Our vows, our commitment, it's unacceptable before God. So, as I close up, I want to show you two sides to this story. There's two sides. If you're a Christian, if you're saved, if Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life and he's bought you, and you're born again, and the Holy Spirit has come inside your heart, and your heart from that moment was changed to love the things of God and to hate sin, if that's you, and everyone around can see that Jesus is Lord of your life, of course you ain't perfect, of course you ain't not stumbling every, every moment of every day, but everybody can see the change in your life. Jesus is your Lord, and you long to serve Him, and you love to serve Him. If that's you, I want you to understand today that when you worship and you come here today, you walk in those doors and you're worried about your grocery list and you sit and you, you reflect on, on Him and all the things He's done. When you worship with your unacceptable worship, 
Jesus intercedes for you and He stops that worship. He takes it, He cleans it, washes it in His own blood and then presents it to the Father holy and blameless before Him. So when we worship God, when we, listen, when we come and we worship God now as Jesus Christ has paid for your sin, that worship is not only acceptable, but it's perfect. It's perfect before the Father because Jesus has died to make it so. He has covered your life, your mind, your heart, your actions, everything that you do and don't do with the blood of Christ. When you pray, Jesus intercedes. He gets that prayer and He presents it to the Father as perfect before His sight. It's Him. If it wasn't for Him, if He would not be the sinless Son of God who died for the sins of the world, if He would not be the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the earth that is the only one that can mediate between you and your sin and God, you would have no hope of your worship, of your prayers, of anything that you could offer ever being acceptable. Ever. You could stand here with all the sincerity of your heart that you could muster And you could cry out to God, and it would be unacceptable. Uh The Muslims are really sincere about their beliefs. The Hindus are really sincere. But it ain't doing them no good. Because Jesus doesn't intercede, except for only those who trust Him by faith. It's like a little boy who brings flowers to his daddy for his birthday. And he goes out in the field and he's picking all these flowers and trying to get all this together so he can give his daddy a gift. So he's running back to the house and he runs up to the front door and his mom stops him right at the front door and says, what is that? And he said, I got flowers for daddy's birthday. And his mom says, let me take them to it. And she takes those flowers and looks at it and it's grass and trash and weeds and junk that he just picked up out of the field. Just, it's not worth nothing but throwing in the trash. And as she's taking it to the Father, she picks out all the grass, all the weeds, all the trash, and she walks by the mantel where all her flowers are at, and as she's walking, she picks her perfect flowers and she puts them down in his bouquet. And when she finally gets to the Father, she says, These are from your son. And hands them to him, perfect, holy, and blameless. No trash, no weeds, no grass hands them to him perfect. When when the believer, the one who Christ is Lord of their life, when he prays, his prayers are perfect in the blood of Jesus Christ. When he serves, when he worships, when he shouts, when he witnesses, when when he does all these things for God, his service, his acts, his worship, his prayers, everything he does is acceptable by the blood of Christ. And only by the blood of Christ. So we have no room to boast in anything. If I'm the greatest musician, worshiper of God up here that plays and worships and leads people in worship, the best in the world, if I, if I do anything wonderfully better than anybody else, I have no room to boast because it's unacceptable before God unless Jesus Christ cleanses it by His own blood and hands it to the Father. But there's another side. That, for me, I don't know about y'all, but for me, that's good news because as a growing, maturing believer, I'm still finding things that I never knew I had that are not good, and I want them gone. I'm still still discovering things that I don't like about myself, that God is showing me. And to know that I'm perfect before God, just because of the blood of Jesus Christ, it's, it's great news. But there's another side. The other side is this, is that if Jesus is not the Lord of your life, if he, if he has no place in your life, if, you know, you may come to church and maybe he's an accessory and, you know, you live your life during the week and you don't really give two thoughts about God or living for him or serving him or loving him or anything. And we don't love him in order to earn anything. It's God who puts the love of him in our hearts. So that's why it's evidence of a salvation because God 
takes out the stony heart and puts the heart of flesh in that causes you to walk after his statutes. If that's not there, you have no assurance that you've ever been saved. I don't care how many times you've prayed a prayer. I don't care what you did in vacation Bible school. I don't care who you repeated after. If you have no heart that God has given that desires holiness. I'm not saying you're perfect and that you, you're the best one in the room, but you have a heart that desires holiness. You have a heart that desires to do for God and to love God and to be with God, not because you're so wonderful and your heart's so great, but because God has changed that heart and given you the Holy Spirit, which does that in a believer's life. If that is not you, it doesn't matter what you did at five years old in vacation Bible school. It doesn't matter how many times you went through the baptistry. Doesn't matter how many times you worship God by playing the guitar. Doesn't matter how many times you've come and sit in these chairs and raised your hands when the music was playing. It doesn't matter. Because the evidence of the Holy Spirit is that you desire God. You desire Him. You desire Him. Here's the thing. If that's not you... You have absolutely nothing that you can offer God to make Him pleased with you. You have absolutely nothing that you can give Him that will make you acceptable. When you come to the church house and you don't want to be here, you're rolling your eyes. You might as well stay at home. Because when you walk out that door, I mean, this is not the word of Jason. I didn't write this book. I wasn't alive when it was written. It says, "Keep the, I'm going to read it to you. Keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. If that's you, you have nothing to offer. You can come and worship with us. You can come to prayer meeting with us. You can come to Bible study. You can come hear some of the greatest preaching from Christ Church that you'll ever hear anywhere on the planet on a daily, on a, sun, a weekly basis, every Sunday, Sunday night, Wednesday night. You're welcome. You can come eat fellowship meals with us. You can come to the hospitals with us. But none of that is going to count that much Amen. when you stand before God because it's worthless. Right. It's not acceptable. And Christian, yours is not acceptable either. It's only acceptable because Jesus Christ bought it with his own blood. That's the difference between the saved and the unsaved. Okay? So I want you to say, before Brother Eddie comes and he's going to pray and he's going to give an invitation, I want you to understand that in order to be saved, you have to come like that little boy and you have to bring God your bouquet. You have to bring God your life. You have to bring him your heart. And you have to trust Him and surrender to Him in faith. And you have to give it to Him. And if you don't do that, if you don't want to do that, if you don't desire to do that, I understand. I didn't want to do it for a lot, for a lot of years. But don't think that sitting in these green chairs is helping you. Don't think, you know, if you're a musician, I'm a musician, you know. Don't think sitting up here playing songs to Jesus is helping you any. If anything, it's making it worse. Because when you stand before the judgment and say, hey, I went to church all the times, he'll say, then you knew better. Then you knew you heard the gospel. Don't think because I'm a good person compared to my next door neighbor that that's going to help you any. It's going to make it worse. There's nothing that you and I can offer God. Not your prayers, not your worship, not your service, nothing. It's all unacceptable outside of the cross of Calvary. It's all unacceptable, and there's nothing we can do.